<laughs> Has Tony gone? Tony's gone. I was going to mention Tony Parkin then, because uh, it's something we were chatting at a while ago. So yeah, hello, I'm Rachel. Some of you've met me already. Some of you know me online. Hello, Richard, in particular, wherever you are. Um, so what I want to do today in, in my five minutes is just kind of pick upon a few, few themes and, and think about a journey. And I was really pleased that James mentioned um, the basic then, because I think that the BBC um, micro, BBCB microcomputer really kind of played a similar role in the UK as, as the Commodore clearly did in Germany. And uh, sorry, I'm just going to choke. <coughs> sorry. <coughs> And actually, um, sorry, I really am choking. <coughs> <coughs> I actually am choking. <coughs> well, I, no, I'm, I've really got a fog in my throat. Yeah, no, wait a minute, I'm okay. It's going to be okay. <coughs> I'm really sorry, everyone. Okay, yeah. It's, it's actually as a result of my experiences with the BBC Micro back in the 1980s that I'm here today. And I was just commenting to David that I was actually doing that in my teaching practice the year that he was born, which is slightly scary. Um, but there we go. Uh, but I think the motivations around using technology for is us in this room now and for teachers out there and in Teach Meets and Miranda Mods and all our various comings together are really pretty much the same. And, and this is really kind of on that question of what do teachers need to know about digital technologies in the 21st century? Or we could call it the third millennium. That might, that might feel a bit more kind of futuristic for us. I don't know. Um, and, and the reason I got into this world was because I, and this again is a bit scary for Carsten and for David, is I actually started off as a German teacher. And, um, and I was teaching in really challenging London schools. And when you're teaching in really challenging London schools, as Lawrence knows, you need every single gambit skill and bit of teaching expertise you can get. And when I was doing my teacher training at King's College all those years ago, on something like one of the last afternoons in the summer, so it was kind of like one of those extra things they gave us to do, was a little two-hour session on computer-aided learning, as it was called then. And in our, our computer-aided learning, I was just thought, this is amazing. It opened up something for me that I thought, this, can, this, is, a, this is a tool I want to use. And so it was great seeing the, 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 the kind of DOS-looking interface that Carsten was showing us there, because I remember all those things as pressing space bar. And it wasn't easy to do, but it wasn't impossible. And it was e easy enough for somebody who had not a clue about these things, as I didn't, to do, to have a go at and to, and to make a reasonable stab at. So that was my one experience. But then when I started teaching, um, I th there was an opportunity to go on a five-day um, course on basic programming in my, in my half-term holiday. So just as many teachers do going back to the themes around professionalism, I took myself on that little course and did a little basic programming course. Again, nothing very expert, very simple stuff, but it was enough that when three BBCBs landed in our school the following term and nobody at all wanted to use them because guess what, they landed and there was no training or anything like, no introduction to them, they just landed there, was I was the only person who could actually have some clue as to how to use them. So they very quickly found their place in my German classroom and became part of the kind of range of things that I had to do to convince these young people that actually it was actually not too bad learning German and, and uh, they could do well, they could be successful, they could enjoy it, uh, which actually lent to them getting quite good exam results as well and, and my becoming quite a good teacher. So all of those things are part of my being, wanting to be the very best teacher I could in that environment. And I don't think any of that has changed. So when I'm thinking about what do teachers need to know about digital technologies, it's about what are the tools and skills and applications that we need to put together to make us better teachers so that children can learn the very best they can, whether they're in, in preschool, whether they're in kindergarten, whether they're in mainstream schools, whether they're in special schools or universities, whatever. It's all about the quality of learning. Now, 
since those days of the mid-80s, I've had many different uh, roles, main, mainly in schools. Uh, I've been working with Stelgis the last few years, and I do a lot of public affairs work for Stelgis, and so by dint of that, I get to speak at events every now and again, and I know a lot of journalists and people like that. And predictably, I got the phone call about a month or so ago, about a month ago, from a, a, a journalist writing a piece in the Times Education Supplement about technology. And the question he put to me was, what's the latest game changer? What is it? What's, ooh, ooh horrible feedback. Um, what's, what's the game changer? What's the, what's the device that's really, you know, zapping everybody right now? And I said, well, I want to unwind that a bit. Let's wind back from that a bit. Because, I said, let's supposing we didn't introduce any new kit into UK schools now. There was just suddenly a stop and we learnt to use what we've got already better. And every single teacher in the country could use what we have today to its full capacity. Let's think about what difference that would make in terms of the quality of education day in, day out in, in, in schools. And so, you know, we've had the kind of interactive whiteboard versus iPad discussions while we've been here. And uh, somebody who many of you will know off Twitter, Matt Pearson, who's a colleague of mine, has written a really good blog post recently about the magic dust that comes out of the vents of various devices. Of course, the answer being there is no magic dust. The magic dust is within us as educators and how we put that together. So I'm not saying that the things should stop. No, they shouldn't stop. But I would say the very first thing that teachers need to know is how to use what they've got, whether, whatever devices they've got, whatever kit they've got, whatever applications and software. Learn to get, learn, love the one that you, love the one you're with, as it were. Love, learn to love the, what you already have and use it the very best to improve your practice before you necessarily go hunting down for the next device because there'll always be new stuff. There'll always be more and more and more. And I was interested with, in what, um, um, what Andrea was saying this morning about liminal space. And I was thinking about, for those of us who are kind of confident enough to be inexpert in this space, and I very much see myself as a, not an expert in this area, for those of us who are confident enough to inhabit this space to do with education technology, knowing that we always don't know stuff and it's actually okay not to know stuff and we can just kind of find our way with the help of our friends and colleagues, that feels a, a, a different thing, but I think the, that, that space sometimes feels very, very big and scary and not wanting to go through that arch for many teachers. And I think that's a real, a real problem, a real, a real issue for us. Uh, and I take the point that was, was just made now in terms of um, how, you know, other, how when others seem so expert, that can also very much get in the way. So, yeah, first thing is about um, loving what you've got and, and knowing what to do, knowing how to use it well. The second thing is not being frightened about what there is and learning about how to use it because there is always going to be an enormous amount of new kit coming through, new, new applications and whatsoever. But we cannot design a single training program that's going to meet the needs of teachers in, in, in schools now because the, the rate of change, I think, is too quick. So I'm quite interested in looking at how we use uh, our social spaces, our social media to benefit that. And I think certainly Twitter and things like UK EdChat, EdChat, uh, which is uh, in, based in the States, um, Teach Meets, events like today, they make, the, uh, but these are all self-organizing groups for the enthusiasts. Which brings me on to really my last point, uh, which is about the government perspective. We haven't talked that much about governments really, apart from various remarks about Ofsted and uh, a few comments about standards. And when, when we look at what's happening in the UK at the moment, um, the government's got really a key obsession, I would say, or, or, and, our, and our, um, the coalition government is really, I would say, very much sticking with conservative education policy. And I think one of the key priorities is changing our position in the PISA um, international comparisons. And that's very interesting because if you read around the subject, I'm sure many of you have, that actually there's such a lot of changes in, the, in how those international comparisons are made year on year. Then there's a bit of a question in terms of, of, of not saying that they're not valid because they clearly do have validity, but there's, there's, it's not a simplistic tool is simply what I would say about it at this stage. And, but changing our position, so the focus on maths and English is really to the exclusion of almost everything else. And this, a lot of the deregulation around the national curriculum at the moment is to 
on the one hand, give people, give schools space, but on the other hand, uh, means that there will be more and more time, I think, spent on those core subjects, particularly in primary school. So where does that light leave ICT? Well, we had the BET speech, which was the one at which, uh, as we've mentioned, uh, the ICT programme and study was suspended. And that has led, and I've recently given advice to a school where they were actually going to make their entire IT department redundant, which was pretty shocking. Um, uh, because there's a lack of understanding about what that means, suspending the program of study. Uh, and then this, uh, this, this introduction of computer science. Now, I actually think it's very positive, the, um, the introduction of computer science. I'm concerned, however, that the way things are playing out in the UK is that IT is going to go back to where it was very quickly in the 1980s when there were people like me, uh, and, and I you know, carried on mainly as a languages teacher and then into the senior management, so I didn't pursue the IT angle, but I could have done, and many of my friends actually went down the computer science route. But, but in those days, IT was very much the preserve of the enthusiast. And what I can see happening now, when we've got this kind of void where we don't have a national curriculum, we're going to have people like us loving to talk to each other about the great things that we're doing, the Teach Meet community and all of that. We all you know, enjoy sharing those examples of great practice, but how, that's not getting under the skin of teachers in general. And when there's little obligation on school leadership, and particularly if it's not enforced through inspection, which it won't be, um, then I think it's actually a really big gap that we've got there that we need to fill. Um, and I think part of what's expected to fill that is through the teaching schools movement. They've got an IT strategy group. That's, the, that's a group that we should be linking in with. But I think that we've got a real risk <coughs> here that, that, that systematic evaluation of how we use ICT to, teach, to improve the quality of teaching and learning in every single subject, which is, of course is quite different from computer science, is that's, that's, that's going to really suffer in this next period of time. Dougal, you're one of a very few people still doing your kind of job, for example. Richard, who's with us, is now working independently, doing very much the same kind of work as he was previously. So, so we've got a huge challenge in this area. So, so how, do we, how do we tackle it? Well, um, I think we do use our social media. Uh, I absolutely agree with, with what Carsten's been saying in terms of the risks there. We were talking about that yesterday. Um, I think it's a huge challenge. So the final thing that teachers need to know is about e-safety, and that's absolutely got to be something that we talk about all the, ti all the time. So, yes, make the most of what we've got. Understand the benefits and applications of new media as they come through, and e-safety, that's what I would say we've got to do. There we go, that's mine.